Hi, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah with the Midwest Writing Center, and I'm excited today to be sitting down with Araxi Cass. Um, we will um, have our regular 50 minute interview thing. Um, then we'll talk about what's up at the Midwest Writing Center, and um, that will lead into a free write that Araxi has brought for us today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Araxi Cass is a writer and editor working across a variety of genres and styles. Her work explores themes of culture, social issues, and the ambiguities of life in multiple identities. She's the editor-in-chief of Azad Archives, and her work has been published in the Armenian Weekly, Blacklight, Blacklight Magazine, The Hyphen Magazine, and others. When she's not writing, she enjoys watching sci-fi, exploring new places, and adding to her ever-expanding library of random knowledge. You can find her work at araxicass.com. Araxi, thank you so, so much for hanging out with me today. I'm going to put the um, link to your website in our um, Facebook chat here, but um, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm super excited to, first, I've never, uh, I've never had an Armenian on the show before, which is really exciting for me personally. Um, <laughs> Glad to be the first. Yeah, I um, uh, guess I don't know a ton of Armenian writers. I would love to make this the Armenian Writer Hour if we can make that happen. Uh, but well, we're hard to find in the Midwest. Yeah, that's true. Uh, supposedly, Minnesota has a church, which is cool. I don't know if you know that. We need to like go find all the Armenians in the Midwest, maybe. Um, and we will. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> in your bio, we talked about how. Um, you talk about culture, social issues, um, having multiple identities. I love, I love your phrasing with that, the ambiguities of having multiple identities, because um, it's a hard thing to talk about because you, it's hard to be succinct. Um, mm -hmm. And like I was in a, an anthology fellowship thing for bicultural people, and I thought that that was so limiting. Um, yeah. Because it's not, having, mul having multiple identities is not having two identities, right? It's it, it's many, many intersections. It's many, many axes. And um, I think phrasing it with the word ambiguous is just perfect. Yeah, and it gives space for like all the different identities too. You don't have to be just like Armenian and American or like I'm like Armenian and Jewish, or the, but you can have like all of these different things at the same time. Right, yeah. And I think that's important. Um, and gets ignored that like no one has a single identity. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'll just use that as a segue. Um, how did you start writing? And then also, how did you start writing on identity? Um, in terms of how I started writing, I've basically always been writing. I like love to write as a little kid. I would write like little kid stories about fairies and stuff. Um, so there is no like starting point for me. I guess I've just like, it was always the thing that I did like after school I did like a writer's workshop in high school and it's just kind of developed over the years to do like different types of writing and I also studied writing in college um and then in terms of how I started writing about identity I think it really coincided with kind of my finding my Armenian identity so I didn't really grow up very much in the Armenian community my mom's side of the family is Armenian but um, she like shared that history with us, but since I didn't grow up around like other Armenian kids or other Armenian people, it didn't seem like a very big part of my life. Um, and that started to change one, when we went to Armenia for the first time. So for those who don't know, Armenia was part of the Soviet Union and thus was like kind of difficult for Americans to travel to for a while. Um, and so like people in my family came uh, like after the Armenian genocide around 1915 but then like my mom had never been before she went with us so we went kind of on a family trip and I guess what it made me realize is like one there are actually other Armenians out there and like the only Armenians I've known before were like my mom and my brother um, so that started so that kind of got me thinking about that and like where I fit in in terms of cultural identity and multiple cultural identities since I'm 
like a person of mixed heritage as well. Um, and so I then, so I think kind of that journey started me writing about that because I was interested in exploring it. And then it just further complicated from there. Um, I started to talk about like being a mixed Armenian and also being queer. And yeah, I just, I love to talk about culture and identity, I guess. Yeah, I um I think the question's kind of a kind of a cheat, right? How did you start writing about identity? We we talk about identity because it's who we are. Um, mm-hmm. and I just I I wanted to jumpstart that conversation. I love knowing though that you started writing as a kid. I did that too. I think it was like escapism, like I was really into fantasy. Um but it's what's that? Oh, I said, just sorry, I was just saying I was a fantasy person too. <laughs> I'm not anymore, and I don't know what changed. I actually, I think that I just no longer have any suspension of disbelief to give. Like, I just have no imagination left. It fell off. <laughs> I started writing science fiction again, and I don't have a lot of time for it, but I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> oh, that makes me so happy. Um, what I know of your writing is um, either nonfiction or um you know, realistic fiction. So that's so exciting. I think that that's like, um, that can be really, really cathartic and important to, Mm -hmm. to get into, uh, the, you know, barely possible, the maybe impossible, the, the unreal, the supernatural. I will stop listing things. Um, (laughs) how old were you when you first went to Armenia? I was, I think 15 or 16. So in the middle of high school. That's really cool. Um, I've never been, um, but I, you seem, we know each other through, through an Armenian circle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just was like, well, clearly she, like being an Armenian is, has always been part of her identity, but um, apparently that's not so, or not part of um, your identity that you had an awareness of or a, a relationship with. I, um, I, the only Armenians I ever knew were family, but I have a huge family, you know, immigrants make a lot of babies. <laughs> um, so it was always at the forefront of my mind with, with my identity, though I didn't maybe know what it meant. So that's, mm-hmm. that was a really, really big surprise for me, uh, especially since your, your book that you authored, um, I was like adjusting my watch, which makes it harder for me to reach over here, Defenders, um, stories from Armenia's border village border villages speaking not my strongest point um is about armenia um so that's a that's also a surprise to me i just assumed um can you can you tell me how this book came to be yes so at, after that first trip to armenia um it was like a very big deal for me cuz it was the first like big exposure to that culture and um after that my mom and I got talking and my mom is a photographer and so she had the idea to do a writing and photography project together um, sort of to photograph and interview people in Armenia and kind of show uh, what was going on like culturally historically and in terms of development in Armenia to people outside Um, so we started with that we started interviewing like all sorts of people from like artists, carpet weavers, to like people doing environmental work, like everything. And in the process of that, we met somebody who worked at an NGO and she started telling us about this project that her NGO had done to build a blast wall around the kindergarten in one of the border villages because it was getting shot at all the time. And we were like very stunned. I personally had never heard about the attacks on the border villages before. Can you give us a little background on border villages? Yes, I'm getting there. Um, so there, since the fall of the Soviet Union, and it kind of has roots before that, but I will not go into a long history, but since in the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there was a war over this region um, that is historically Armenian and is, po- is populated by ethnic Armenians. It's called Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh. And It was placed in Azerbaijan during the Soviet Union. Um, And so as the Soviet Union broke up, uh, there were like pogroms and campaigns of ethnic cleansing against Armenians in that area. And it turned into a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So after that initial war ended, um, there was 
for a while no longer full-scale fighting, but the Azeri army continued to fire pretty regularly into the border villages of the actual country of Armenia. So this was not reported on very much and it wasn't something I'd heard about before. So when we did hear about that, both my mom and I were like, people aren't talking about this and they should be because this is, you know, a, soldiers fighting, firing over the border on people who are just living in the village, on kindergartners, on people in the streets. So we started to document that and focus our work on that. Um, and so that is what this book is based off of. I decided to write it because I wanted to try telling those stories in a less documentary format and one that was more realistic fiction. So these stories are based on real people that we met in the border villages and real events that happened, but the, they're not nonfiction in that every single detail is not true. And I did take some creative license to kind of recreate the feelings and experiences that I had there. So that is how this book came to be. And it was part of a larger project documenting um, what, not only what's happening in the border villages, but also the forms of not creative nonviolent resistance that people engaged in there. That was so beautiful. It's such a perfect, um, yeah. I don't know, talk. It was, uh, <laughs> it was beautiful. Um, something that I think that is worth noting in your book, I want to say this is a dedication. Yes, it says this book is dedicated. Um, you say the very last sentence is my greatest hope for this book is that it can show them that somebody is listening and they are not entirely forgotten. Um, First, I mean, that's just a beautiful statement, but also um, we, Ar Armenians were, were called the forgotten. Um, I don't know that we are anymore. And there used to be this really beautiful documentary website, um, documentary website, meaning a website of documentation called the forgotten, which was then bought by uh, the people who made the movie, The Promise. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a bummer. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so just, um, there's, it's not wordplay, but it's kind of wordplay that you put in there. Um, that's really beautiful. And, and what a great mission too. You're not so much saying like, I need to educate the world so much as I'm here in solidarity. And I think that's bigger, and that is, more beautiful. That, that sentence came directly from something that we heard a lot. And that I heard a lot from people in those villages who would say like, no one is listening. No one cares about us. No one wants to hear you know what's happening here so my goal was to like try and I guess amplify those voices and have somebody actually listen to them we're listening we're here we we're reading your stories yeah so it was it was really nice for me to be able to um after I wrote the book like be able to give it to people in Armenia and say like look what you know I'm trying at least trying to share your story um, that was going to be my next question. Did you, were you able to give it to those, to those people? I mean, not everybody because not everyone speaks English and my Armenian is <laughs> not good enough to write in Armenian. Um, but whoever was able to read it, I did give it to them just because I wanted, I mean, the initial purpose of creating this book, it's self-published and I initially did it to um help with a fundraiser for the NGO that brought us to the border villages to help them for one of the projects that they were fundraising for there um but then afterwards like it's still up on my website and I've sold it at other times as well so, yeah I love that. I'm just gonna keep saying I love that this whole time <laughs> um and now I've, I, I've got my my wheels turning about about translation opportunities so we'll talk about that sometime off the air um <laughs> what was it like writing it um it was it was pretty intense I think it's like very fulfilling but it can be really difficult to write about this kind of really emotional stuff and I uh I found this all the time when I write about you know kind of the stories we heard and some of it is really heavy like you know people who've lost family members to the violence or even like the fact that children are living with PTSD um, from getting shot at all the time. So it was, it's, it's really like, it is difficult to write about this kind of stuff, but I think that it's, it's really worth it. And 
it was also a good experience to to express these stories in a different form than I was used to doing just the like nonfiction documentary form. That's um that's kind of a surprise. It feels very natural. Um it's I haven't read the whole thing, I will be honest with you. Um <laughs> but it's a. Uh, I don't, it feels very natural. Um, so that's kind of a surprise, but I think that sometimes there's an urgency to to the stories we tell that that allows for that. Um, and that's really what I assumed about about this volume, that it that it was just something that needed to happen and you were um, the perfect medium, right? Maybe I'm getting like a little woo-woo on this, sorry. <laughs> no, that that is how I felt. I was just like, and that's how I felt with the whole project. I was like, somebody needs to do this. So I'm here, so I'm going to do it. I love, I love that. Turns out I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> Thank you. um, let's switch gears, but only a little bit. I know you have a new publication of which you are an editor in chief. Um, what can you tell me about Azad Archives? I'm going to share the screen while you talk, um, but I'll have more specific questions about Azad Archives in just a moment. Okay, so I'm really, really excited to introduce this platform. We actually just launched last week, so we are extremely new. Um, and Azad Archives is a submission-based digital multimedia platform that is dedicated to breaking the silence on important issues and speaking about taboo topics. It's focused on Armenian and Swana communities, um, but is open- Can you define to Swana for us, please? Sorry, yes, thank you. Um, SWANA stands for Southwest Asia and North Africa. It's, it covers a similar region as the Middle East, but is a little bit less, is more like geographically based and less based on where it is in relation to Europe. Um, so that's um, why I use that term. That's, that's, that's a favorite term of mine. Um, when we say, uh, or when you say, in, in relation to Europe, in relation to the West, we have, um, we when we describe things here as say the middle east or the near east or the far east um we're saying that as ourselves being the center of the universe um and so i think that yeah. this small piece of of decolonizing language is important mm -hmm. so yeah it focuses on armenian and Swana communities but is open to all and is um dedicated to amplifying marginalized voices and marginalized topics so like, for instance, this one that is on the screen right now is um, uh, the personal story of a queer Armenian person. Yay, <laughs> thank you for subscribing. Um, everyone else join the party. <laughs> I thought it would be cute to do that live. Um, but if you need to talk to me, please contact me through the Midwest Writing Center. <laughs> My Gmail will ignore you. <laughs> Sorry, you were telling me about the, the queer, queer Armenian story. Yeah, so this, um, I just wanna see, use that as like an example of uh, the way that we are trying to up, uplift marginalized voices like queer people are often very marginalized in Armenian and Swana communities in general. Um, and yeah, we try to have a, a combination of very serious, important topics like, I mean, all topics are important, very serious um, topics like the one on the front page is about the practice of bride kidnapping in Armenia. Uh, which is unfortunately prevalent still to this day. Um, but we also want to mix it with arts and culture, like these pieces here as well. So I know her. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really excited to be working with an amazing team. Uh, we have a web designer behind this whole website. We have awesome graphics people, amazing writers. How did you decide to use, this is not really relevant, I'm just curious, how did you decide to use uh, the language Nagorno-Karbakh? Um, that was actually the choice of the writer who wrote that piece. So that I, makes it easier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's referred to, as you know, as both Artsakh and Nagorno-Karabakh. So I feel like there's advantages and disadvantages to using either term. Totally. Oh, totally. Um, and I assumed that that would be the reason. Uh, <laughs> I want to draw some attention here to to your um, that that it's bilingual. Um, this is the same piece here. I'm assuming based on the image, <laughs> um, and you have it both in English and in Armenian. 
Yeah, so we wanted, since we are, um, the team starting it is a team of r and we really wanted to have it be available to people both in, in English speaking world and in Armenia. So we are really lucky to have an amazing translator who has translated all the pieces into Armenian and can also do the other way around. Like if a piece starts in Armenian, write it in English. Um, and I think it's really important because so much stuff is only in one language and it is really nice to have a platform that connects both. Yeah, that's um, really impressive. I was gonna ask about that because that's a lot of work. <laughs> that's not, uh, that's not Talks to our translator. She's potatoes. potatoes. Um, you already answered all of my questions. I was going to say, what's the mission and, and who contributes and how did it come? Oh, how did it come to be? Um, so it was quite a process. Um, it grew out of a team that was working for an Armenian feminist organization called Quidix, um, which started off as sort of like a feminist online space so we had a blog and that's where I started writing articles for the blog which are actually still up there um yeah. and so the organization started in 2018 and has grown a lot since and as you can see here it has shifted a lot to being an aid organization so um that started in last summer when the um, explosion happened in Beirut there's a huge Armenian community there. And the organization started by providing period kits to people in Beirut. Um, and then very shortly afterwards, um, the Republic of Artsakh was attacked by Azerbaijan and there was 45 days of full scale war. Um, and the organization really shifted during that time to providing immediate on the ground aid, like life-saving medications. So, during that time, the focus of the organization shifted a lot from its original blog, <laughs> blog sent and content centered um, iteration. So during that time, the those of us who were writing and creating in other ways were trying to think about how we wanted to keep that mission alive because that was really, really important to us, speaking about these taboo topics and having a space where we all felt safe as women, as feminists, as queer people, et cetera. So that was kind of the initiative for starting Azad Archives, um, which is separate from the Quidix platform, but fulfills a lot of that mission of speaking on important issues and being really a space where we can all be free to speak about whatever we want. I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna find other words to say. I swear, um, they will be in the same vein. It'll be like I dig it. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm really kind of asking these questions out of order. I I apologize. Um, okay. But um, you've also sort of already answered this. But how does your maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I am under the impression you are an activist. Um, separate from your writing and you know as a human being who cares about things that writes you you became uh both but um did your writing influence your activism did your activism influence your your writing um your travel how um how do these how do these how does the relationship between your activism and your writing work yeah, I mean, I see it as being very intertwined. I end up writing about a lot of like social justice issues because I tend to write things when I feel like a conversation needs to be started about whatever the issue is. Um, so I guess I end up in a lot of kind of activist writing spaces because of that. Um, in terms of non-writing, I would say that like writing is the main vein through which I like try to like talk about social issues and uplift the voices of others um as well like through my own writing but also through sharing and linking people um so yeah in terms of activism um I don't know I feel like I just I just have a very strong drive to stand up for things when you know, when something is happening that's really wrong or um, I've always had trouble with defining myself as an activist. Um, 
because it's not like that conscious, it just feels to me like a thing that needs to be done. I exist, therefore I'll say something when something was wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You also said something, I sort of, um, I asked the question really badly because the original phrasing I had for this question was really presumptuous. Um, and you said something and I expected the sentence to end differently than it did. You said writing is the main way that you process um, something. I expected you to say the world. Um, or I like mean, that is life. true. But, writing is um, like process everything. Or I expected to have a moment to finish my m, &M. Um, <laughs> I'm a professional. Um, but yeah, I sort of, I also assumed that you by virtue of having had, you know, three conversations with you, <laughs> I assume that you you were inseparable from both of those things, from the writer, artist, and the activist. And so I'm glad that you confirmed that, my gosh. Um, yeah, I, no, go ahead. I feel like writing is what I'm best at in a lot of cases. Like, I'm not the person who organizes the protests or, like, is especially good at, like, I don't know, giving speeches or doing posters or anything like that. So writing is where I feel like I can often be the most helpful. And that's so important too. That's, um, it's not, you can't just have any one of these things. Mm -hmm. You need language. Um, it all works together, I think. Now, are you, are you not a student? Did you already graduate? I am about to graduate in like a couple of weeks. Congratulations. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, so how do you, how do you balance that? I know being a student is not easy, uh, especially on your time, on your schedule. How do you, how do you manage to be, you know, in journalism and actively writing and actively acting um, while being a full-time student? It is a lot. Um, I've always, been the kind of person who just like I want to do a lot of things and I, I get very busy because of that um I did struggle a lot in the beginning of college especially because the school that I go to is very intense very stressful um at UIC you a University of Chicago so it's a very intense school um and I guess I mean I've always I think for me finding balance is all about like finding priorities and for me, writing has always been a priority because I know that no matter what I do um, in the rest of my life, like I always want to be writing. So, and the other thing is that like, you know, sometimes something has to give, sometimes it's finals and you just don't have any time for writing or sometimes, um, you know, I do writing and other things go by the wayside. So. I don't know, for me, it was always just really important to keep writing because that was the thing that I always knew that I loved to do and always knew that I wanted to do. Um, and yeah, finding balance is always hard, but I do think it's like a work and it's always a work in progress for me. Like I find a balance of how I can get everything done and then my schedule changes and then it's all a mess again and then I work on it again. That's so, too real and I hate it <laughs> yeah I'm currently in another period of since I've finished with my classes and my thesis now I'm doing other work and I'm in another period of like figuring out how I can make all of these things fit together in my life yeah no it's not easy I was once in a um panel about um my cat is here um I was once in a panel panel about um work-life balance as a writer like work writing life balance um and I was so confident and I had all this stuff to say and it was like not a day later that it just all blew up in my face I was like the mad hubris of me thinking I could speak to this <laughs> I feel like I feel like for me part of balance is being okay with the fact that there isn't always balance sometimes one part of life just goes crazy and you have to that's um that like profound that was profound <laughs> um but also a really important lesson that I mean I'm sure I'm not the only one who needs to hear it's you know sometimes something's gonna fall away mm -hmm. that's just life yeah but I've uh, like I learned early on in college that I really need to make time for like 
myself, taking breaks, mental health, because I can be really like, in terms of school grade driven or otherwise just driven to work all the time. So I'm very conscious about making sure I don't do that and I do take breaks. I wish I learned those lessons in college. That sounds really useful for shaping like a productive, healthy life. Uh (laughs) I learned it through, I learned it the hard way, I guess, through not having any balance and then being like, this cannot continue. Oh, see, I just would shut down then. Um, (laughs) It's fine. We we go at our own pace. Um, No, that's wonderful. I think... um, it sounds really obvious now that I think of it that like prioritizing and also self-forgiveness um would be I'm always learning that lesson because I like to just do everything (laughs) and every time somebody asks me to like join a group or do a project I'm like yes I would love to do that and then you end up with so many things yeah yeah I I I know that feel um (laughs) yes I know that feel um So I guess since we talked about prioritizing writing, what do you love about writing? I could. I mean, I do you love it? I guess you could just do it because you're compelled, um, <laughs> which is me sometimes. I do it because I have to, not because I'm happy to. <laughs> I mean, there's always those moments. I feel like no matter what you do, sometimes you just are not feeling it. But I do love writing. And I guess for me, one thing that I love about it, it is, is that it is the way that I process the world around me. So it feels like on a personal level, it's a way to explore my own thoughts and feelings and also like organize them. And sometimes like through writing something, I actually figure out how I feel or how I think about it. Um, and I also love it as a method of communicating with other people, because I feel like you can communicate such different things in writing than in speaking. Um, And sometimes you can go deeper into different topics when you're just like writing your thoughts or a story or something on a page. And I also just really love imagery and the power of like imagery and description to like create, create the like to, sorry, (laughs) to uh, allow readers to like imagine themselves in a different place. That's what I'm trying to say. When writing uses uh, different parts of the brain from from speaking, which is interesting because we're both, both use language. Um, But I say um a whole lot less in writing. (laughs) Yeah, I I do a lot of like interview-based stuff. And one thing I found really funny when I started transcribing interviews a lot was that we write so differently from how we speak. Like when you transcribe an interview, you have to edit it a lot to just make it sound like a conversation. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. I'd also say, um, nope, I lost it. Speaking is hard. Yeah, oh, I, I, I say a lot because it's true um, that I, you know, I'm just not, I'm not a talker. Um, if you, if you want to know how I think or feel or what I have to say, like talking to me is not the best way to do it. Um, and I, I get really mad every once in a while, someone, my dad will say, well, for, for a writer, you know, aren't you supposed to be better at words? And I'm like, no, no, I don't. I write because talking is not where I am eloquent. Uh, It totally totally relate I feel like I can express myself so much better in writing and people often I've heard that same thing said to me makes me so mad like don't just be rude to me like you're just you're crapping on me in like three different ways right now (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know it's just like that's how my brain works I even like when it comes to like the way I organize my life I have to write everything down otherwise I just like cannot register it (laughs) Oh man, me too. Uh, but <laughs> we can talk about that later. Um, I think it's interesting too, you know, how many, I find it's like one or the other writers either start writing really, really young or wait until they're retired mm-hmm. um, to start writing, though it seems like, you know, everybody sort of always wanted to or felt compelled to. Um, and I think that those of us who start young are maybe. Uh, 
I don't know, playing with escapism or um, world building more than those who who come to it later. That's something I just think about sometimes. I love world building. Uh, that was one of the things I was really excited about when I started working on a science fiction story again was the ability to like build a whole imaginary world that's great does it feel um how does that feel uh compared to your your journalism your, your non-fiction um i well i started it first because i love watching science fiction um i've watched so much star trek in quarantine that i cannot even quantify it anymore um Are you the person i was talking to about um i think you're being about... armenian or wait no i didn't hear this i think i've talked to my mom about it not the actor i just think that bajor is is armenia that's it like it's i, I have thought that too <laughs> um, i have the biggest crush on kira and um <laughs> that's that's the end of the story i mean it's obviously uh you know any any massacred people right it's any any people who has experienced genocide and it's star trek so it's wildly political um but i very much prefer to think of Kira and and the Bajorans as Armenian. Sorry, uh, back to back to writing sci-fi. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess part of the reason I wanted to write sci-fi again was because I, I mean, I studied uh, nonfiction writing in college, so it kind of ended up, and the combination of that and like the journalistic work that I do, it ended up being like the majority of the writing that I do. But when I started writing, it was all like fantasy and science fiction. So I kind of wanted to just get back to that creative imagination part of my brain. And also I wanted to, I mean, I guess it wasn't new because I'd done it before, but do a different kind of writing than I was used to so that it, I didn't feel boxed in like I could only do one type. That's so important. I, um, I babble on and on and on about how we need to experiment and like, Mm -hmm. disregard genre and you know do things that are hard because eventually you do you just do by virtue of being human feel like you can only do one thing mm -hmm. uh, I mean I'm certainly generalizing here but I really do think that um with enough of putting ourselves in boxes we think that we belong in a box yes. so I'm really happy to hear that and I am excited to see it I don't I clearly watch Star Trek um <laughs> but I don't I don't engage a lot with sci-fi in 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 literature and that's something I intend to change. I picked up Octavia Butler last week so mm. I'm on my way. I read Kindred I over the summer. <laughs> it's such a good book. Um, good. I want to read more Octavia Butler as well. I have no idea the name of the book I have um, <laughs> but <laughs> I am advised that is, it is dystopian sci-fi hmm. but I think that's like all she writes. That. So, yeah. Um, oh my God. Can you hear the cat? It's too much. <laughs> oh my God. That's not the one that's usually the cat being on Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, do you have, I'm, I'm like skipping around because I'm trying to make there be a flow and it's just, I, I wrote my questions and like threw them at the wall and in like splatter paint style. Um, I like that metaphor. <laughs> I'm just imagining like a splatter pan of interview questions. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't want it to be like to see what would stick, you know, it wasn't like noodles. <laughs> um, it's actually very pretty. It's just a little messy. <laughs> you know, that's not a bad thing. Do you have um do you have any advice for folks who want to write to or for or within social change or identity? Those are two different things. Let's talk mm -hmm. about social let's talk about identity first folks who are interested in identity writing or writing on identity um you I guess don't have to have advice no no I'm just trying to like organize my thoughts um I guess identity writing is it's a little difficult to give advice on because it's so personal and like you know the way every, every person expresses and understands their identity is really different but I guess for me, one of the things that is that I learned is that I had to decide what I was comfortable sharing with the world. Um, and I personally like to write everything that I think in the first draft. So I just like, get it all out there. 
But what I realized is I started writing and publishing some of it, although there's still a lot that I wrote that I have not published, um, was that I needed to think about like the, what I was comfortable sharing about my own life, but then also how I was going to deal with the way that, that other people's stories were included as well. Um, and I personally like to stay, stay within my own story as much as possible, because I think like, it, things can get very messy when you start telling other people's stories and your version of it might not be their version of it um and everybody's everybody's thought on that is different but I would just say like it's an important thing to think about when you start writing personal personal essays or stories or whatever it is um yeah I guess that would be my biggest thing but also when it comes to writing it any kind of writing I think the best thing to do is to just start somewhere yes thing to I'm, write. Gonna, I'm gonna make like stickers or something that just say start somewhere I think that's just good life advice um <laughs> yeah I just elbowed a glass of tea um <laughs> also you said the second the second I lose it it's just gone um start somewhere is so beautiful but it's also um I give this advice too that you just gave which is say everything you can cut it later um I write such garbage first drafts. Actually, that, that's my other advice to people. If your first draft is garbage, it's okay. Don't don't judge a book by the first draft. Uh, <laughs> that's the other, you know, like if you're thinking of an audience or or potential impact when you're when you start out, like you're not going to write anything. It's too much pressure. You can't um you can't have an audience if nothing's written. Yeah, exactly. And like I wrote. Um, an article about like Armenians and having solidarity with other groups recently and the first draft it was, it was like very angry and it's not something I would publish because like the way that I expressed it in that version I don't think it's helpful at all but it was something that I had to get out there before I could uh get to the yeah. like, more well thought out intelligent version of that article like when people tell you to write a letter to to someone you're mad at or emotional about or whatever you just it, it's it's part of that so is so well. that you can get to the better version <laughs> i've yeah. never actually taken that advice but i imagine that that's the purpose <laughs> i've never written a letter like that but that's just like how a lot of my first drafts end up very i i write letters as like my primary form uh, <laughs> and some of them have started out as uh correspondence um which were never sent thankfully, but like, there's something in my brain that needs to be convinced the person's going to see it. Mm. That's really interesting. Maybe I should try writing letters. I am a, an expert in tricking myself is what I've learned. <laughs> Do you have any advice um, for folks who want to write into social movements or social justice um, or activism? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of things at work when you write about social issues, social justice, social movements. One is, the first thing I would say is to always ask yourself why you're telling the story and why you are telling the story, because I think that it's, it can be really complicated to write about certain issues. And um, especially if you're coming from like a more privileged place, like being American or being a white passing person um, or being a white person, you can, there's a lot of danger of like writing exploitatively about issues that you care about and trying to do a good thing, but it ends up not like being harmful. So I think that that is something to be very careful of. That's something that I always try to think about, like why am I writing about a certain thing and how do I make sure that it's centered in my own perspective and not trying to speak over or speak for somebody else. And the other thing that for me is really important is to know that I might make mistakes and to obviously I try as hard as possible not to like, you know, do, do anything harmful. But when you're writing about really complex and often really contentious issues, like you, you know, no one person knows everything. So I guess I also just try to make sure that I'm open to um to thinking more about things even after I've written them and changing my opinion if it needs to change 
for um, folks interested in more on the topic of how to know if it's your story to tell, we've got a video for that. Um, mm -hmm. That's a <laughs> that's an issue that's really, really, really close to my heart. Um, so I've uh, developed lesson plans around it. So I just had to shout myself out there. Um, it's, like, it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, because especially since I do a lot of work that involves interviewing other people and involves other people's stories, it's, it can be like really difficult to strike that balance of like speaking about and with other people, but trying not to like overshadow them. I love, um, I love, I love the use of prepositions in conversations like this because you want to speak with <laughs> and um, to, but you don't want to speak for. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a language nerd. Um, but it's, you know, it's very, very important to, when you're passionate about something, especially to not, um, in, in your excitement to, to speak on <laughs> um, and to be involved with uh, an issue, it's, is really easy to decenter the narrative from the folks who should be the center. Mm -hmm. so and I'm I think you brought always, that up. Sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think it's always a balance between, you don't wanna be too afraid to speak up about something because you're afraid you're gonna say the wrong thing, but then on the other hand, you don't want to speak over people. Totally. Um, we're coming in on 50 minutes. Do you have anything you want to add? I can ask more questions, but um, I, I have enjoyed the flow of things. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I love talking about writing. So this time I don't have to like annoy my family and friends by talking about writing. Um, you about always writing. hit me up when you w want to get nerdy on writing. Always. Amazing. You know how to find me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll then scoot into my other questions that I had prepped were just not as fun. And I feel like we ended it on such a great, like where we are right now is a really great spot to end. Um, so I'll give updates on the Midwest Writing Center's uh, upcoming events. And then um, you'll give us that writing prompt. If you don't remember it, I can give it. Um, and then I will set a five minute timer. You can, uh, you don't have to participate. Uh, if you don't want to, but I always do. And sometimes I end up talking to the camera and being like, oh, I just thought of this thing in my writing practice. Um, but also part of that is like, it's really weird to be on camera and saying nothing and like having someone hypothetically watching you write is weird. Um, <clears throat> talking to yourself on camera is also really weird. Uh, anyway, um, what's up at the Midwest Writing Center? Um, let's see, this weekend we have the deadline for the Young Emerging Writers Internship. So um, if you are or you know a young artist ages 15 to 19, this is a paid internship that meets three times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday throughout the summer. Um, we work on reading and writing and editing and workshopping and design. We put together a gorgeous, I had it ready to go this time, I always, that was a bag of m &Ms. Um I always have to reach for it. We put together a gorgeous literary magazine. You end up published at the end of the summer in um, some really beautiful work that you will definitely be proud of. The, the growth scene over the summer is just fantastic. So um, those applications are due this weekend. We say May 15th is the deadline, but we're not gonna check mail our email until Monday. So um, send in those applications. <clears throat> um, all the information I'll post um, our web address in the comments. We also have uh, next week on the 22nd, I believe that's one week from today, we have, nope, it's a Saturday. Um, <laughs> we have our first live event. It's outdoor at Roz Talks, which is in um, Rock Island, Illinois. The headliners are gonna be Beth Roberts with her new book, Like You, out from Front Fence Books. Um, we've got ZH Collins, Shishuan Collins, um, sorry, XH. I can't, I can't with the X's today. It's the strangest thing. Um, she is a Midwest Writing Center author and um, her novel, now I'm gonna reach back for this one, uh, Flowing Water, Falling Flowers came out in 2020. So this is gonna be her first event that is not virtual. Very exciting, very beautiful book. Um, highly encourage reading it. And spoken word poet and former intern. <laughs> <He's so cute. laughs> Hi buddy. So it's normally the black cat that's just screaming at me, but this is my orange one. Um, <laughs> the third headliner will be Kaylee Cool, uh, former YUW intern and uh, winner of the Iowa Chat Book Contest in 2020. Um, her work is 
always mind blowing. <laughs> We're so cute. That tiny, tiny mew. Um, what else do we have? We've got birdies for charity going on now for the next little while until the John Deere Classic. So um, if you're thinking about donating to the Midwest Writing Center, um, birdies for charity will add a 5% <clears throat> um, match on your donation. But we also, the Midwest Writing Center is super lucky to have two donors who are willing to match um, combined up to $10,000 in donations. So your, your money will really go more than twice as far if you donate to the Midwest Writing Center through Birdies for Charity. I'll put the link to that in the comments as well, but we are uh, charity 1370, 1370 with Birdies for Charity for the John Deere Classic. Um, we also have a couple of prizes. There's um, an e-reader up for, up for grabs um, for donors, um, free tuition to the David R. Collins Writers Conference. And let me tell you about David R. Collins Writers Conference. Uh, the full price of tuition is um, 270, which is super cheap, especially considering that we've got Joe Mino on short stories. He's a Nelson Algren award winner, like no big deal. Um, the best short story writer I can think of. And um, short stories are my bread and butter. We've got Gail Marie Thompson teaching poetry. The title of that class is Gratit Unabashed Gratitude in Difficult Times, which is like, I think what we all need right now. We've got Liz Lenz back with a personal essay. If for some reason you've never heard me talk about Liz Lenz, you're lying or you've never heard me speak before. Um, her books, Godland and The Labored are, um, were both you know listed everywhere for must reads. She's got a new one coming out uh, next year. I believe. <laughs> it's so cute. He's never, he never wants my attention. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, hi, baby, come here, come here. Um, what did I say? We've got um, Tarek Shaw for novel writing. Sorry, I um, I thought I could get him to shut up, but I just got him to leave. We've got Tarek Shaw, uh, author of Whiteout Conditions um, from Two Dollar Radio, teaching novel writing. Um, our keynote address is from Allison Joseph, who is you know not a small name in poetry. Um, it's going to be really, really excellent. Um, three of those authors are also writing one-on-one -on -one manuscript critiques, um, which is crazy. I'm like trying to scramble together something to show to Joe Mino or Tarek Shaw. Like, they're going to look at my writing? That's possible. Um, we also have um, manuscript pitches available for, with MWC Press and with Legacy Book Press. If you're interested in um, setting up those pitches, you're absolutely more than welcome. <laughs> um, but just to note that Legacy Book Press is a memoir publishing um, publishing house. Um, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, so I'm going to shift over to um, our free write. If you're leaving us now, please write more light into your life. Araxi, please. What is our, <laughs> what is our what is our writing prompt? Okay. Um, so the writing prompt I have today is to, it goes along with the cultural identity themes we've been talking about, but it is to pick a cultural artifact. And I um, would encourage everyone to think big with this. It could be like an heirloom or like a type of food or even like a uh, figure of speech or something. Um, any sort of artifact that is meaningful to you and write about it. So it could be a scene, a story, a poem. I like big open writing prompts. I, um, should I put that in the chat or something? Oh yeah, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it might be helpful to see it. I know I okay. A cultural artifact and right into it. Yeah. Um, I find um, big prompts kind of intimidating. However, I have something, here, let me just show you my messy office um, right in front of me. There's some dolls. I don't have any idea what you can see. Dolls on the wall, um, <clears throat> which are from our media. So I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to put five minutes on the timer here. You'll see me jump out of my skin when that five minutes is up. Um, and of course, let's let's write more light. I would really love to see uh, poetry in response to this, but that is too intimidating for me. Um, I'm just going to do a proper free write.
also, you know, you can really, um, if you wanted to, you could really call anything a cultural artifact. Like if you've got, um, um, you know, a hamburger wrapper next to you, like play, play around with it. If you can't find something off the top of your head, you know, like um, I've got a DVD of Roseanne here. Like, what does that say about the culture in which I exist or about me as someone who owns DVDs still? Got about 40 seconds left. I'm just putting stuff in the chat that I said I would. It's very much for me like toast, like if you are waiting for the toast to pop up, it's going to scare you. Um, so that totally messed up like my whole life uh, as as an adult, you know, 25 years removed from when I received those dolls. Um, I've been to foreign countries and been to their like open air markets. And I'm realizing that's probably like some some really cheap thing bought at an open air market for tourists. And it's been like so special to my heart for 26 years, 25 years, my brain is exploding. Um, and that's what I really just journaled about it uh, because I had that realization. <laughs> Thank you so, so much um, for that prompt and for hanging out with us today. Um, Thank you and to everyone out there, please uh, write more light into your life.